This is a list of degenerative diseases that can cause low back pain, specifically chronic low back pain that happens for several weeks to months to years. We're going to break them down into a few categories. The first is discogenic disease and degenerative disc disease follows under this category. So disease that comes from the discs, discogenic. The etiology is a combination of catabolic activity and or mechanical disruption or just trauma to the spine. So you can have an injury that compresses the spine and causes rupture of the discs or a herniation of the discs. The pathophysiology is that the herniated, ruptured, or otherwise damaged disc can compress the nerve root. This releases inflammatory mediators that can result in axial, which is pain down the spine, uh, and uni or bilateral radicular symptoms. So the disc is this purple thing in the background here. And when that bulges out, when that herniates, when that breaks, it impinges on the nerves. You have nerves going uh, almost all around this disc, um, especially coming out to the sides, and you have the spinal column uh, in the axial direction as well. When the disc bulges out, when the disc breaks, it can compress those nerves, and that's what gives you the radicular symptoms. It could be on one side, unilateral or bilateral on both sides. So you have axial pain from the actual uh, damaged disc, and you have radicular symptoms coming out uh, with the nerves on one or both sides. The radicular symptoms can cause decreased sensation, strength, or reflexes in the limbs uh, when those nerves are compressed. You want to rule out cauda equina syndrome in patients with discogenic disease. So you want to ask them about saddle anesthesia. You want to see if they have urinary or bowel incontinence. Those would be concerning signs for cauda equina syndrome. There are a few tests you could do that would be positive for discogenic disease. There's the straight leg raise and there's the slump test. Um, the, I think the slump test is a little bit better than the straight leg raise. Um, neither of them have really good uh, sensitivity and specificity. For the slump test, they're about 80%. For the straight leg raise, it might be a little lower. Next disease is facet arthropathy. Ar arthropathy. The arthritic disease of the Z-joints are shown here. The Z-joints are in pink, and this is a uh, connection just paramedian to the transverse processes, and these articulate between vertebral bodies. So if you have arthritis in this pink area, also the same pink area here, you'll have facet arthropathy. This can present as a non-radiating axial back pain, although you might also have referred pain to the flank or thighs. This referred pain is distinct from the radicular shooting electrical pain that you might have in discogenic disease. So you might have a patient that complains of back pain that kind of goes to their butt, that kind of goes to their thighs, that kind of goes to their flank, um, but that should be differentiated from the shooting electrical um, spark-like, very quick on and off pains of the radicular symptoms from discogenic disease. Facet arthropathy can be provoked by facet loading, and there's a maneuver you could do to test this. So you want to ask your patient to extend their back and rotate to the affected side. If that elicits pain, then it's more likely that they have facet arthropathy. Again, the sensitivity and the specificity for this test isn't really well studied. It varies in the literature. Another possible problem is sacroiliac joint dysfunction. Um, this would be a little bit lower back pain. Um, the SI joint are synovial fibrous joints that transmit force from the spine to the pelvis and then from the pelvis to the lower extremities. So they bear a lot of force. Symptoms of sacroiliac joint dysfunction includes low back pain, usually worse on one side, although it's possible the patient has it on both sides. This can be caused by arthritis, spondyloarthropathy, and pregnancy. There are several tests that you could do to elicitate uh, pain in patients that have SI joint dysfunction. You could do hip flexion, abduction, and external rotation. That's called the Faber test. You can also do pelvic compression, and you can also palpate their PSIS, their posterior superior iliac spine, which is just at the top of their butt, um, lateral to midline. Next is spinal stenosis. You have your spinal cord, of course, running down in the axial direction. And if you have degenerative disease that for some reason causes narrowing of the spinal canal, this could be due to discogenic disease. This could be a bony uh, breaking, a bony deformity. Then you might have spinal stenosis if you have narrowing of the spinal canal and impinging on the spinal cord. 
You might also have subarticular recess and, and neural foramina narrowing, and in that case, you could have impingement of the nerve roots coming out there. So impingement of the spinal cord at least, plus minus impingement of the nerve roots. That can cause inflammation, pain, and dysfunction. The symptoms will be neurogenic claudication. The patients uh, can have lower extremity weakness with lumbar extension, and oftentimes that weakness and pain is relieved with flexion. You might see the shopping cart sign when a patient has more relief when they are kind of bending forward, hunched over in front of a shopping cart. Um, and oftentimes old people do that if they have spinal stenosis to relieve their symptoms. There's also muscle sprain, strains and sprains that can also cause chronic low back pain. This is often the paraspinal muscles, lateral to midline, and it's often following an injury or exercise. A patient might say they were stretching their lower back and when all of a sudden the pain started, that could be a muscle sprain. This is painful and it's often reproducible spasticity on palpation. There are some other considerations for chronic low back pain that you don't want to miss as well. I hope this summary of these diseases was helpful and thank you for listening.